for Christmas. DesKelly.ie Cloudy and misty with outbreaks of showery rain in many areas early this evening, gradually clearing by later, later tonight with lowest temperatures of minus 2 to plus 2 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. This, this is News Talk. Hello, you're welcome along. So Ronan Nagara in studio coming up around half past seven or so as he gets ready to head back to New Zealand. We have Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor talking Ireland, Italy on in Chicago this Saturday. Keith Andrews in the football show on bad footballer diets and Dan McDonnell is here as well. We'll talk to Doc Cork amongst other things. Hello, Dan. Hi, Joe. And Richie's here. Hello, Joe. And Ronan's here. Joe, how are things? Full house. 53106 is the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. If you're streaming and you think we look slightly darkened and red, the screen to our right has been turned red because it's Halloween. Mm. Disappointed you didn't come in costume, Joe. <laughs> I didn't realise it was Halloween until about eight minutes ago. How can ago. you not realise? It's been fireworks ha- in the air. Dublin is alive tonight with sort of bad fireworks. It's been Halloween for like the distance. last week. I've been the, in the office all day, haven't noticed. It's funny, isn't it? You know, you, that's a sure sign you're getting old or you don't have kids. You don't have kids. That's more so the sign. It used to be a landmark day on the calendar. You'd know Halloween was coming for months and now I just found out at five to seven on the 31st that today is Halloween. Oh, you'll find that's out on your shocking. way home. Is that right? A lot of, a lot of fireworks going off outside. Going off yeah. out there. Look, these yeah, things People happen. complain about the Halloween decorations, but at least it's a bit of a buffer before the Christmas stuff. Like, I love Christmas, but when the decorations are coming up, Oh, it's Christmas tomorrow, in Oxford. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. at least it's a little bit of a... No, no, no. I was in Liffey Valley over the weekend. The Christmas decorations out the oh. front were there and ready to go. These things mm. happen. So I said to Dan, what do you want to talk about at the top of the show? And he said, Paddy McCourt. Paddy McCourt. Well, Paddy McCourt, he said. The Mercurial. Well, I was, I was writing about Paddy McCourt today. And actually, Halloween in Derry is a big thing. A huge thing in Derry, actually. And like Paddy McCourt is like a Derry... The Derry Pele, as mm-hmm. he was known at the time. But Paddy McCourt... I, when I asked you, I said, Joe, have you ever seen Paddy McCourt play? And I said, I've never watched a full 90 minutes. Paddy McCourt pops up on my phone whenever he scored a ridiculous goal again. That's how you'll remember him? Yes, I suppose so, yes. Yeah. No, because Paddy McCourt, well, the context is that Paddy McCourt is playing his last game as a senior footballer on Friday. He's uh, playing for Finn Harps in the promotion relegation playoff. And uh, they're 1 0 up from the first leg. He scored a penalty, which is the least Paddy McCourt goal of all time, you know, sort of stroking in a penalty. And yeah, after that, he's, he's retiring. He's actually already taken up a job as the head of the Derry City Youth Academy. So he is going to be involved in football going forward. But I was just making the point, and I was making the point in the piece today, um, that really, like, he is. It's an experience to have gone and watched Paddy McCourt play, and I'm glad that I did, really, ultimately, that I think in terms of the last sort of 20 years in terms of players who are just entertaining, who are just brilliant to watch, who sort of inspire you to sort of watch and like football. He's up there and uh, sometimes doesn't get mentioned. I think it's probably because he played his international football for, for Northern Ireland that when people talk about, you know, the League of Ireland players, you know, it's, it's a common debate and everyone go out, oh, Kevin Doyle and Seamus Coleman and James McLean and whoever. McCourt sort of tends to just get forgetting some, you know, forgotten sometimes. Yeah. When actually, if you speak to a lot of the lads from that era, um, you know, particularly sort of the mid-2000s and, and stuff, and you know, who was the best you played against? McCourt's name is the one that comes up again yeah. and again and again. And just a, a, an unbelievable natural talent. For people who haven't seen any of his goals, I think a lot of people out there will. And, and there'll be fans of Celtic where he was an absolutely sort of cult hero figure, but uh, an amazingly gifted footballer who just did incredible things with the ball. And that, to me, that was the point of the piece today, that that's his legacy. I think, you know, you could argue he could have done more. There's no doubt that's the case. Mm. Um, and why didn't he? The, the, doesn't matter that much that he didn't. Um, yeah, it's it's a good point. I, he, he has spoken honestly about it, that. I think when he was younger, his lifestyle, his, his attitude probably wasn't the best. And he, he would have been at clubs where there was a probably social activity was a big part, a big part of it. And he was probably susceptible to that. And um, I mean, I've watched him speak about this at length in an interview he did with a, a, a podcast, actually, a sort of a video podcast in, in Scotland. Um, very honest about his own limitations and his, his in terms of like his uh, aptitude and 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 so on, um, and and you know there was always these these comparisons to how he went by players with sort of George Best and all this and mm. people say yeah he's you know he's out and about town as well too isn't he but um, he he went to Celtic and Gordon Strachan was the manager there and I think he probably you know, took a dim view of some sides of his. Uh, 
I guess, his, his day-to-day approach to work and maybe he wasn't maybe a Strachan player in, in some ways. Yet, the fans loved him mm. because uh, you pay your, whatever it is, you know, your, your 15 euro, your 20 sterling or whatever you, it is to, to go into a ground and to, to watch a game. I mean, I heard you speaking about going to the Preston, Rotherham or whatever at the weekend that... Uh, you, you love that player when the, when he gets oh, on the ball. Imagining football to be. Yeah, when he gets on the ball, you, you, that that home in the crowd, it's like something's going to happen. Might happen. Yeah. Something might happen there. To Charlie's career, so he went over to Rochdale Young. So 01 to 05 was at Rochdale. Yeah. Back to Shamrock Rovers. Three years at Derry City, where he played very well. Yeah, it's six months at Rovers, where Rovers were all over the shop. They got yeah, relegated. Case, they relegated that year. Um, I think he spoke at length in that part, but it was the best weekend of his life. He played football on Friday and then on the soft Saturday, Sunday. And it was a great, he was in a house with six other lads in Dublin, Dublin, including some interesting characters. So it was a great time for him. Um, But then, yeah, Derry City, where he, they had a very good European run under Stephen Kenny. Um, You were saying Stephen Kenny wrote him a letter. Yeah, at one point, Stephen Kenny, in his own sort of man management style, decided the best way to try and communicate to McCourt was to write him a two page letter. Just to uh, about his behaviour after well, then. just to say some things he could change, you know. To be, they didn't McCourt didn't go into much more detail than that, but some things he could change with a view to, uh, I don't know, developing on your potential. And and he played some excellent football there. So at Derry, he was about to join West Brom, who I'm fairly sure were in the Premier League at the time, or certainly they were in that yo-yo phase where yeah. they were Premier League club. And he was in the West Brom training ground, right? Um, or as he said himself in the interview in a pub across from it, uh, when he got a phone call from Celtic to say that Celtic were interested in him, or a phone call from his agent to say that Celtic were interested in him. And um, there was an emotional pull and maybe a better deal or whatever, and all of a sudden he went he went to Celtic. So, I mean, again, is it a sliding doors thing? What, yeah. what if he'd played in the Premier League? But what team might have trusted him to, to play in the free role that maybe he might have needed at times? I know he, would, he had this luxury reputation, which I think he would dispute because he would argue he would track back and do his work. But I guess he was one of these special players that... If you have him on your team, you probably need to make some adjustments to, to yeah. let him do his thing. And how did he do in his five years at Celtic? Well, see, I, like I, I was just looking there. We went down a rabbit hole of montages of his goals, which are hilarious. The one for Shamrock Rovers and the second one. At the ones against Bray, yeah. I each that. time Trevor Malloy turns around like he's seen a ghost. <laughs> yeah. Just can't. What am I seeing here? This is it's, a, it's this brilliant. Is a freak. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. great. He puts his hands on his head as if to, you know, as he's watching the goal happen. Real, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Um, looking at the Celtic goals, like. You'd be wrong to say flat track bully, but I was saying, what's his defining goal? Has he has he run the pitch here in a big Champions League game or done anything like that? And yeah. yes, so now, obviously nobody runs the pitch at Champions League level really, unless you're Messi. So yeah. it's probably an unfair question. Yeah, but you take my point. No, I take your point, and particularly if you're playing for Celtic in the Champions League, there's a fair chance he might be the underdog figure in in quite a yeah. few of the elite games. He, what he does is he makes defenders look really, really bad. And what I just need to know is, are these defenders usually really, really bad? No, I, he's done. You know, he he can do good things against good, competent, you know, players, and 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 made them look silly as a matter of course. I, I don't know. I I'm not a looking like, ardent. I mean, I'm not a Celtic fan at all, so I haven't like followed. You know, we speak to end outside who's a Celtic fan and just thinks what a legend. And but that, he thinks they're all legends. That, well, okay, that, that's a flaw. It's a character flaw. He's but, yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. But I think the way I sort of would phrase it, that it seemed like in a certain big games he'd be like the number twelve. He might be like the Wes figure in a Go different on and way. The game. That you know, people would say, well, why isn't he playing more? Um, and there certainly was this thing with Strachan that I'm not sure if he just fully um, like the cut of his really, jib. Well, yeah. no, I'm not sure if he just really believed in him. Um, Wasn't sure where he could fit in to be the central figure, uh, and I guess I mean, Celtic would have had good players as well around yeah. that time. They were still pretty good. I think it was uh, Macamara have been there. I'm trying to think as my crossover. Right, Endel Macamara was there. And they'll correct me on that, but yeah, he's shaking the ass. Well, so. either way, your point is this Friday is the last time to see Paddy McCourt, obviously for Finn Harps. One other question: Limerick, yeah. 2002 is when he made his debut for Northern Ireland. Mm. Sammy That's, McElroy captain. Okay, yeah. so just 18 caps for Northern Ireland. Mm. And and there was a, there was a sadness towards the end that he, he actually under Michael O'Neill, yeah, you know who actually sort of found room to play him and and uh, you know to his credit did that and then he, I think he would have been in the Euro 2016 squad but his wife suffered a brain tumor so he had to sort of. Uh, come home and treat her and that led to him coming home and effectively being part time for the last couple of years in right, his career right. um, but yeah 18 caps uh, there was a long gap between the first one and the second one okay. uh, he was he was capped at the age of 18 um, when he was at Rochdale I think the first ever player from Rochdale to play international football against the Spain team that was going to the 2002 World Cup to play Ireland so I think Raul was on the pitch and a few other legends like that and the, you know 
you wonder, is he one of those that in a different time would he have been courted by the Republic of Ireland? I was just going to say Paddy McCourt from Derry may have... May yeah, have for Ireland. you wonder. Yeah, I, I definitely think. I definitely think. You know, it's hard to understand why he wasn't capped when he was at Derry City. But then again, um, you know, would there be people in Derry who would have a view on why that might have been? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, I, it took a while for him to really get the recognition at international level that maybe, maybe he he deserved more caps. I think there's no probably no okay. argument. But it, he could have done more. But my argument is, does he can obsess about legacy and, and contextualising it too much? Yes, but yeah, yeah. Uh, he did brilliant things that made people like football. So I, I sort of think. So you're saying I'm wrong to say where did it all go wrong? I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a where did it all go wrong. It's like uh, thanks for those times you made it right. You know what I mean? Like, and I think I like think you've mentioned the Paddy McCourt story. People like will respond positively rather than going out oh, Paddy McCourt. Yeah, I yeah. think it's like Paddy McCourt, brilliant. Yeah, you know, he brought joy. And it's true, it's a bit schmaltzy, Joe, but it sort of is. Oh, that, that's, that, is, that, is that is the case. That's that is you the case. Over. You said the Preston Rotherham game was a bit dull. If you had a Paddy McCourt figure, you might have had a, like, a moment to take away from it. Amen. No, it's true. And he's got a rare thing in the League of Ireland where he's basically universally liked for the most part, like most players yeah. would love that kind of player in their team. And yeah. when he came back to Ireland for that brief stint towards the end. They're a snipey bunch, League of Ireland. The hair, fans. The hair you know what I mean? There we go. They always have a problem with something. Again. They have a problem oh, with something somewhere. Yeah. Paddy McCourt, one of those rare things there that they go. don't have a problem Football with. Football man, Joe, he's going to games now. He <laughs> even, 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 with his, like, even his hair, his distinctive style as well, probably that was also part of the thing. If he was a sort of a crew cut figure, I don't Wouldn't know, would have, had, would have had the same oh, Joe would have liked him then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, straight lace. Good straight solid lace. haircut John there. Joe likes a Johnny yeah. Unitas figure. You can cut your, uh, some haircut you can cut. Just play a game of golf with him at some stage maybe, you know. That's exactly that, what he wants. How would he look in a, a, you know, a bit of a v-neck kind of Pringle jumper? The news round is brought to you this evening <laughs> with Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. And uh, Richie, you're starting with the live football this evening. Hot, hot. Frank is going home. Action, yeah. Frank, there's a man with a good haircut. You could put your watch to Frank Lampard's haircut there. Says it all about Joe Malloy, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Uh, Frank Lampard plotting the downfall of his former club tonight. He brings Derby County to his longtime employers, Chelsea, in round four of the Carabao Cup. And Lampard has been asked what it would be like to lead a side to victory at Stamford Bridge. It would be great for the club. For me personally, I'm doing my job. So to go up against Mauricio Sarri and a fantastic Chelsea side, at a place that I kind of call home, um, to win there, of course, I'd be proud of my team. I'll be very proud because there's a lot of work that goes into preparing for this game as I prepare for every game very strongly. So, yeah, you know, I'd have to sort of be very uh, um, thoughtful in victory, um, which wouldn't be a problem for me because I respect that club so much and the fans. But of course, I go there with a team trying to win the game. So watching Frank at the weekend, Derby Middlesbrough, one of the great own goals of all time. Oh, I missed that. Oh, it's just fantastic. It was uh, Middlesbrough scored the own goal. I mean, it was a header into the box and I mean, from about eight, nine yards out, the defender was trying to volley it, I think out for a corner over his own goal. But it sort of hit his knee, rolled down his shin and whacked into top a top corner. corner. Oh, it was an unstoppable yeah. finish. The best <laughs> Just shock from everyone. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's there's nothing okay. better than a good own goal. No, you love a good own goal. Yeah. But uh, Lampard's done okay. I mean, already yeah. the story's gone around today of uh, already Abramovich is keeping tabs on him, you know, yeah. and... Uh, it's almost like you know Lampard and Terry are engaged in a race to build their managerial stock. You know, who can who can get there the quickest? Mm. You know because it feels like that's where it is going to go. I mean, he would strike you as an intelligent type, very level-headed kind of character, a bit of emotional intelligence. Intelligence. He came across well, well in the punditry stuff, didn't he? Where yeah, he very well. A bit more about he's sort of self-aware about. I don't know, like the, the area he lived in and the hype and all that went with it. And yeah. uh, but he, he's actually quite excitable as a manager as well. Like you, I think you've seen him. I probably was after the Manchester United game, was it, where he's out on the pitch leading the whole thing with the fans, you know? And he's not sort of you know, suave and sort of saying, "I'm detached from this." You know, this is this is a championship team and this is championship firm above it's this. Or something. Even in the first game of the season away to Reading, he was yeah. very involved in the celebrations uh, at the end of that one too. So he's kind of he's already bought into this thing. He's got a lot of young players. He's kind of brought in players well on loan when you look at Harry Wilson going in from Liverpool mm. yeah. he very much had a hand in that deal coming there So yeah okay so um, other few bits and bobs Arsenal playing this season yeah Unai Emery admitting he's picking a side for the visit of League One Blackpool with one eye on Saturday's visit of Liverpool in the Premier League there's a debut in defence tonight for Arsenal's Julio Pleguazuelo uh, alongside the likes of Ainsley Mate and Niles are in there and Emile Smith Rowe but it is a side that contains Aaron Ramsey, Henrik Mkhitaryan and Danny Welbeck. Meanwhile, Blackpool start with ex-Limerick defender Paddy O'Connor, who's currently on loan from Leeds. Well, touching on the football show, I know you were looking at it, Ron, as well. There's yeah. pretty interesting stuff around Blackpool and their supporters at the moment. Yeah, well, people remember that fairy tale rise they had in 2010. T- in Holloway. Ter- yeah, yeah, exactly. And then just kind of flew down the divisions, ended up in League Two, are back in League One now. But 
just the ongoing strife behind the scenes with the ownership and fans that have this unique protest where they turn up on game day but don't actually go into the ground to give their money. They still travel in numbers away from home. And for example, tonight where some of the cup revenue will be filtered into Blackpool, mm. they're, they're st staying away from this one as well. So really in that piece there in the Telegraph, uh, Chris Baskin, I think. Yeah, it was, it? yeah. No, it's so, worth the read. I didn't realise what was going on. Uh, yeah. There's something very poignant about the thought of generations who've done it before meeting for their pre-match pint at two o'clock and then not having to go through the turnstiles. Yeah, there's a really toxic atmosphere around the Oystons who yeah. own the club and what they've done with it over the course of the last oh, half decade or more. Well, it's really grim. Certainly a court of law found that the owner, there's a father and a son, basically, I don't know, it was wrongfully the term, but yeah, in layman's terms, wrongfully took about 29 million out of the yeah. club in the Premier League yeah. era. Um, and then he's been convicted of rape in the past and so the Premier League were meant to have get, got involved with fit and proper persons test and he was going to transfer it to his son and then just didn't and Richard Scudamore sort of said yeah sorry we actually should have stepped in there stepped in there and just didn't <laughs> so yeah so it's uh, it's actually pretty grim if you're a so this, uh, yeah, it's sort of the nightmare story when you consider the, what are the, the, the romance of Blackpool getting to the Premier League yeah. at the time but actually it's almost like that's that's Exposed them to the worst of what could possibly have happened, mm. you know. And mm. um, yeah, we've seen some teams slide down, but this one, this one's been going on for a long time. Yeah, we'll tease it out a bit more in the football show. Meanwhile, Spurs are playing again. Yeah, they are, and again, they've picked uh, some inexperienced players in their side. Paolo Gazaniga starts in goal, and they've got the likes of Juan Foyt, Kyle Walker, Peters and uh, Deli Ali starting for them and Fernando Llorente is up front as well. Meanwhile, Middlesbrough coach Tony Pulis welcomes his former side Crystal Palace to the Riverside, should mention as well Declan Rice uh, starting for West Ham, more of whom and on. Uh, but Conor Murray may yet feature for Ireland during the autumn campaign. The Munster scrum half is yet to play this season due to a bulging disc in his neck and have been targeting a return for late November with his province. Murray was left out of Joe Schmidt's extended squad for the upcoming tests with Italy, Argentina, the All Blacks and the USA. Before his coach Simon Easterby has revealed that Murray has been training with the Ireland squad in Carton House this weekend and potentially could be offered game time. However, in the absence of Murray and Sexton in Chicago this week for the test with Italy, it's up to others to step up. It's a great opportunity for the halfbacks, Luke McGrath and uh, and uh, Joey Carberry, you know, Ross Byrne and um, and uh, John Cooney to to kind of share that workload and especially at halfback where we've been fairly consistent probably in our selections over the last couple of seasons, you know, with uh, with um, Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton, you know, playing the majority of big games. Uh, it's great that, that those guys will will share some responsibility. Yeah, the thought of a revised squad and Conor Murray's name being in it on the week of the All Blacks test would be very nice indeed. We'll talk to Ronan O'Gara in studio. He was in earlier on. I will play that in about 10 minutes' time. And then Rory O'Connor and Keith Wood on the way after 8 o'clock. So you mentioned Declan Rice? We did. He's, uh, his declaring for England appears all the more inevitable. But according to the latest reports, the star this morning ran a story claiming West Ham midfielder had met with England manager Gareth Southgate earlier this month when he was presented with wide-ranging statistical data illustrating how he'd fit into England's plans. Martin O'Neill has also reportedly been in contact with the thrice-capped 19-year-old. Dan McDonnell. Well... Uh, <laughs> We've got a squad announced. I see. I, 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 I've, I've, there's a couple of comments today suggesting <laughs> the Declan Rice saga is now over, and I'm like, oh lads, you know, the international. How many Dan McDonald uh, journalistic stars out of ten are you giving this story? No, no, no. That's not. That's not that. I'm just saying that. Um, I mean, I, I think even the story itself doesn't put a timeline on when the decision is going to be made. Mm. So. Uh, uh, and, you know, so you try and make inquiries today, so are the FEI expecting anything or anything like that? And I don't think that it would appear to be the case. So we've got a squad announcement next Tuesday. Uh, Martin Neal's name in the squad for the two November games. Uh, and do I think we're going to be talking a lot about Declan Rice again, you know, around this squad announcement, I would say that's probably the case. Because he's joined England? Um, no, because it, it may well be that there's no decision yet and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And, and I... I, I I mean, there, in some ways, there's been a certain consistency about the fact that the, the deadline was the end of the year and the decision might be the end of the year. And that's fair enough. Uh, but there's obviously six games between September and the end of the year, and it's hung over all of them. And uh, do I think that there's a danger that it's going to hang over the start of the next one? I think absolutely a very strong chance. So um, I, I just don't think it's over. I think there's a certain inevitability about the way it's going, um, but I don't think it's it's over in terms of, well, that's it. Okay. It's gone now. Um, I, I think we'll have a bit more of the uh, what we've had before. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what the wide-ranging statistical data was that you showed him? 
I'd be, no. Honestly, Jay, I'd love to know what that might be. Do you reckon O'Neill has uh, indulged in similar? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> with, with, what with, might uh, it be? What, what, what would the data be? Well, this is the it's this is the type point. of player you are. This is how we play in midfield. And so, this what's is how the you data? Passing here are the other. Passing here are the other. Passing here are the other nineteen-year-olds, eighteen-year-olds. Uh, you know that we have. Yeah. And uh, here's here's what you can offer, and here's what you bring. I don't know. The, the one thing I, about the, the whole Rice thing and England's role for him is that there was comments from the English technical director, who's actually now I think left, but speaking about actually their real issue was centre halves. And uh, that's where they actually need players. That, yeah. That's where they feel is a weakness. Right. Whereas Rice, we talk about more as a as a midfielder now. Um, but uh, although I think his Twitter thing describes him as centre half, and obviously we all look at his Twitter to see if he's liked anything in the last hour. <laughs> this is what we're reducing. And he this shamrocks. Journalism 2018. And he flag what is he like? No, it's just a picture about some reality show or like a fire thrower or something. You know. What's he into? What does this mean? I haven't been on his Twitter much. What's uh, I don't know, just uh, anything, everything, anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, like he's 19, so I mean, he's got a wide range of interests. Jack Grealish killed us with the shamrocks and the flags. Well, Even. Royce went a bit further. He sang the anthem, <laughs> played three times for Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I, think that, I think that one's the harder that one. That was to very take. leading, I thought. <laughs> That's the harder one to take, Joe. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, Qatar then? Yeah, FIFA president Gianni Infantino looking to break down more than footballing barriers in his hope to have 48 teams at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. He's asked the Emir of Qatar if he consider allowing games in an expanded tournament to be held in the likes of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain oh, well, why not? and the UAE. I mean, let's really, let's really move this thing onto a higher plane. Exactly. Bring in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> to add to that, all three countries we mentioned there have cut ties with Qatar and have closed land, sea and air passage to the country. Infantino has restated his desire to expand the World Cup to 48 teams, a cycle earlier than originally planned. An expanded tournament would mean 80 games instead of 64 and possibly require more than just the eight stadia being planned in Qatar. So he's kind of hoping to bring peace to the area. <laughs> bring peace to the Middle East by Gianni Infantino. FIFA's <laughs> relentless desire to find regimes even more dislikable than <laughs> FIFA. You know, let's like, yeah. we're not that bad. We could be a lot worse. Look where we're bringing you to. You've so just killed a journalist. Let's give you a World Cup game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 48 teams for 2022. He was very down on this idea before. He was he was all for this initially, right. the forty eight team idea, and then at the last sort of congress uh, event that he had, probably around the World Cup, actually, he was admitting it was a bit more of a problem. Okay. Uh, he has said this, I think, as he was like it's at an event in that region where he's saying I, I can bring good things to this world. Mm. This, the feeling seems to be it's more very unlikely that it's still going to be twenty twenty two. But for, we know what's happening twenty twenty six. Um, but 2022 probably less. It's terrible, really, isn't it? Because you think of the World Cup just gone. There was just enough quality to hold the thing together. It was just about right, you know. Just the group stages were just about right. But you wouldn't have wanted to have diluted. Joe, them all my more. view on this is that I still haven't physically been present at an Ireland game at a World Cup, and I, I, I don't <laughs> know if I'm consistent enough to to okay. really take the, the football purist view. Um, so you'll have a 48 team World Cup to get Ireland. We'll go 64. There. If we can get Ireland there, <laughs> how far do we have to go? I don't. I don't care how far we have to go. I don't care if we're playing Burkina Faso in the first game. Yeah. I. I you yeah. want to be there on a jolly. Well, I don't know. I think the balance of their the balance of their teams in the World Cup is is, is questionable. But they're trying to address that by giving sort of votes to everyone. I mean, it's all a cynical political exercise. Sure. That's what it is. There is no football logic behind that. I, I do sort of agree with you on that. But I think I could probably get over it if Ireland were going. Okay. So, uh, any other bits and bobs then, Richie, finally? Uh, Dan Levy's been released from Ireland duty to travel with Leinster to South Africa. The flanker is one of eight internationals travelling to Port Elizabeth for the Pro 14 game with the Southern Kings. Six academy players are included alongside the experience of Dave Kearney, Scott Fardy, Michael Bent and others, while Tyler Blayendal will captain Munster in Sunday's Pro 14 game away to the Cheetahs. His name stands out amongst an inexperienced panel that's travelled to South Africa. Sammy Arnold and John Ryan have also been released from the Ireland setup and could play a part on Sunday. Out half Blayendal has played for Munster's first team in eight months due to a neck injury. Uh, while the World Anti-Doping Agency has criticised an emergency summit held at the White House calling for anti-doping reform, WADA say their lack of involvement meant the summit was one-sided. WADA Vice President Linda Helleland, who has been openly critical of the reinstatement of Russia, was among those to attend, as was WADA Athletic Athlete Committee Chairperson Becky Scott, who has claimed she was bullied by Executive Committee members over the Russia decision. The summit was organised by the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy 
and the United States Anti-Doping Agency. Whistleblower Yulia Stepanova was among 14 athletes in attendance where those gathered called on WADA to undertake greater efforts to listen to athletes' voices. Sport Ireland also adding their voice to that and in the wake of the Scott allegations they've called for a robust independent inquiry into WADA's culture. Cheers, Richie. That's your news round done for this evening. We've got Rory O'Connor and Keith Wood on the way after 8 o'clock. Ronan O'Gara popped into studio earlier on. We'll bring you that next. Off the ball on News Talk. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. News Talk has teamed up with BMW Ireland to celebrate the brand new BMW 8 Series. To mark the launch, we're bringing you an exclusive event with a host of rugby legends ahead of Ireland's defining match against New Zealand. Join Keith Wood and some very special guests.